uh, for one thing, are these uh, Isa Sonica articles, I think, that uh, you uh, might see in here if you go under uh, library, here are the Isa Sonicas. I have uh, circulated, actually, the printed forms of these Isa Sonicas. I don't know if you saw this. Uh, the le last one that was published is um, Greenwood, uh, Sasanian Reflections uh, in Armenian Sources. Uh, Prophet Law well, doesn't look very good at this one. Edinburgh. Pardon me? Edinburgh. Edinburgh, yes. Uh, who's an armonologist, but also very interested in learning material as well. Pardon me? He's in St. Andrews. I'm sorry, yes. He's in St. Andrews. Uh, so we seek help from people from different areas, uh, especially Armenian cities, and I think I blame Professor Venetian for making me interested in Armenian cities and why Armenia is important for studying this region as well. I just want to show you, and we also do some archaeological works. Uh, there's been quite a bit of work in terms of archaeological excavations done in Iran in the past 20 years, believe it or not. And the government was paying for these. And uh, at the problem is that most of these reports were not published. Uh, in Iran, the archaeological service is very different. You do like you're going to work. Uh, to, to uh, you know, doing some uh, your job that is more administrative. You go dig, you get money, you write a two-page report, it's filed, that's it. That is the most that you want or need to be an archaeologist. Of course, some archaeologists indeed have published some of their works. What we've done is to make connections with the Miras of the National, the Heritage Organization, at least people in there, to be able to solicit their work and have it translated into English and first place online and then printed as such. So here is the excavations that recently were done at Sadristan in the province of Fars, if you want to see, so you can get an archaeological report. And I think going electronic has actually a lot of, uh, it makes a lot of sense because it opens up the, uh, you know, uh, the information to not only people in the US, but all around the world. Uh, you get this uh, sense of connecting. And I know this because people read it and whatnot. So this is one thing that we've done uh, in terms of this Sasanica series. Um, in terms of other works that we're working on uh, is the archaeological matter that you see, for example. We're trying to fill in, of course, all the dots. And this, of course, takes some money. So my endowment goes partly for the creation of this website, but also um, the creation of uh, something like this where you get, for example, Bandion, which I was able to travel, a lesser known archaeological site on the border of Turkmenistan, and Iran, where you'll get some information of, in the past decade, uh, the excavations that's been done, and what kind of report uh, you will find. So some heftalite and Sasanian images, and I don't know why this is, oh, there is actually this much. So you get not only a narrative of what's going on in Bandion, but also um, the excavations. That is another part of the Sasanica project that we're doing at UC Irvine uh, to uh, actually make the Sasanians less, uh, you know, of an oddity. And again, we're filling this out. We're doing another batch that should be done. We have about eight or ten of these sites right now, and we'll have probably another ten by the end of the year. That is another part of this uh, Sasanica work. Um, again, um, and of course, help is very much needed. Uh, here is our material or the image gallery. Well, let's go to the actually the material culture if you want to see. Again, articles uh, by experts on various parts of coins, seals, bullae, glass work, metal work, and whatnot. And that is what I am trying to do as well. Does anybody holding these books? Can I get these? Up? And another series is these Sasanica booklet series. I think the last one uh, is, is a book by Andre Daribodi, who is in Bologna. He's actually Ravenna. He's published the Sasanian coinage and history at the Civic Museum in Milan. So we also have a series going on Sasanians. The next volume is by Negin Miri. Uh, who did her PhD in Australia on historical geography of Fars, and then Carlo Ceretti, who is Professor here in Rome. Uh, he's, right, he's written a book on the Paikuli inscription. 
And so this is what I do basically uh, uh, at Irvine uh, with the Sasanical website and the publication and this idea behind it that there is an Iran Shah uh, as this cultural unit that needs to be studied to become somewhat on par with the Roman world and to get a better I think, perspective uh, of the region and the period. Oh, sorry, this was basically mm -hmm. talk. It was more okay. of a show and tell than actually anything uh, intellectual. But if you have any questions, I would be happy to. Okay. Yes. Um, thank you for this, this very sweeping and wonderful overview. I have one quick comment, which has to do with um, the the history of scholarship that you outlined and the um, disdain that scholars in the 19th century had for Sasanian art and culture. I think that needs to be seen in a broader context, as you well know, of um, general disdain for anything um, late antique or late Roman. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, it's, it's sort of equal opportunity snobbery, right? Um, anything that reeks of decadence that is past the glorious period of the Roman Republic or the first two good centuries of the Roman Empire um, gets neglected and gets sort of snubbed. And you find that in art history and in history of the sub-Roman, late Roman period um, until really the scholarship of the 1970s, even for that part of the world. So I think you know, within that context, the Sasanians are not necessarily singled out, but it's part of a larger phenomenon. Thank you for that comment. Yeah, if I may also continue on what uh, Claudia said to Ash, um, um, the, same, the same in the Seleucids are completely ignored, you know, that's the um, um, same, same idea. Uh, neglected until, obviously, uh, later on in the 20th century, you have uh, some champions favoring them. Uh, everything beyond the classical uh, high age of Greek antiquity, short of Alexander, is obviously neglected entirely. But there's also something else which uh, has to be mentioned with the Sicilians, it's just the sheer impossibility to cover them. Uh, because of the linguistic barriers, um, you know, you can maybe do uh, even even you know uh, even for Byzantine period, um, it's just a recent phenomenon that people are interested in Syriac and Armenian within from the classical field. You know, you were just mentioning Claudia that Fergus Miller is doing our Syriac now. Obviously, the Camden professor of Roman history now after post retirement is doing some Syriac to tell you how obviously uh, how you could do just with Greek and Latin within this world uh, and and cover basically. Uh, uh, part of Roman and Byzantine history, but uh, with the Sicilians, you are obliged from the beginning to cover 10, 15 languages. And uh, within our educational system, who, who is just able to do that? You know, who, who has Greek and Latin anymore within uh, in high school to, to just graduate from there and then go to, uh, you know, to apprehend other languages? It's just impossible to do Sicilian history. Hence, there are a few number of people who are just even venturing in there at all. So the linguistic barriers is yet another phenomenon that is prohibitive in in in, uh, in, you know, in prohibitive in, in the search of dealing with the city. It's not it's not anybody. And and then even if you have the languages, it doesn't mean that you're a historian on top of it. You know? so, so there are uh, thousand different problems. Uh, hence, it, it is obvious that it should be neglected. Uh, it, it's just not feasible. And then that's the reason why we shall never get uh, maybe foreseeable time a, a complete history of the Sicilian Empire by one, you know, penned by one person. Well, I mean, what I'm trying to actually do is to exactly go against this idea. I completely understand that there's so many languages involved, but to make it an impossibility to take stabs at it, teach it as it is, as it has been understudy. So when Joel Walker, who does Syriac and perhaps Greek, picks up and takes one aspect of so one part of it, and when you know Matthew Kanepa was an art historian, who doesn't know any of these, but ends up you know dealing with art history and the presidential power in the Sasanian period, and someone else. In this way, we get a better sense, and it makes it much more interesting to, uh, I think, uh, neighboring disciplines and also people who are working on this. Um, you're absolutely right that it's very difficult, but I think it should be tried. Nothing should be left as uh, such. Otherwise, everyone will be just reading Christians. I mean, uh, still, other than all, everybody's looking at Christians. And no, absolutely. I, I do not mean that we shall not endeavor, but that is a reason why it hasn't been dealt with so much. And obviously, that which you don't know is usually uh, neglected. 
And I wanted to ask about 4A, 4 and 5. Science. <laughs> yeah. 4A, 4 and 5. Right? Yeah. That's, that's, uh, Darya, you yeah, yeah, Iran. Yeah, yeah and Sasanian Persian. Um, you know, beyond this passionate work of, you could call it salvage historiography, the interest of uh, mm. doing a readable, reader friendly, uh, comprehensive history of what is a missing part of, of, um, of uh, your own particular, which you perceive to be your own particular project. Uh, both in terms of your two titles and in terms of, say, what might be the next phase, what would be your historiographical approach? What are you going to continue these, based on the titles, of course I can't tell, these scholarly or reader-friendly co comprehensive approaches, or do you find yourself influenced by other historiographical trends that I would like you to mention that might uh, gives us a, a sense of where your projects are going based on the fact that it seems that one aspect that's been missing, I'm attributing to you the possibility of uh, someone not knowing the languages but interested in that particular period, coming from another Roman history or whatever, going to your works, but then what would happen next besides, uh, these, these are highly specific, um, detailed. Uh, the web lets you do that. But your project is, seems to be more comprehensive, synthesizing, but it doesn't mean you have to continue in that direction. So historiographical approaches, that would allow me to think about where you're going mm. next. Well, there are two things that are in my mind and in my play to work on. One, uh, again, influenced by Pierre Briand, this great historian of the Acumen of Alexander the Great, where uh, he has this Persica series where he actually sort of set out on how to study the Acumen Empire and what's been done on the Acumen. Um, I am in the process of finishing this book on not only Sasanian historiography, how the Sasanians think about themselves in okay. the past, uh, but also I think it has a part of what I've been presenting in this talk and the last talk as why even this is important. What's the consequence of this? Uh, you know, how does that impact the region and you know, the, the area from Oxus to Euphrates? Catalog of it. I mean, there are catalogs of the major general modes. I was in Mumbai. I was shown about not that there will be any something new perhaps, there were about six or nine cabinets full of manuscripts that they themselves didn't know what was in it. And they just had not bothered or wanted to open to most people that they didn't trust. It had some Syriac and Greek and things as well, but all in all the mere version. There's so much uh, there, which goes all the way to the Abbasid period, I mean, mind you, and, you know, it's you know, early Islam make a large part of these, but there are some that could be classified as representing the society world for that. That needs, I think, to be classified first, we need the catalog, we need to see where the manuscripts are, and a slow process of translation of these. Now, in my mind, the first thing I would be is to translate and put it on the back. Since, you know, I'm at a stage that I don't need to have printed publications left and right now to say, I did this, I did that. I'm, I may just do that. And that may be, you know, the response for it. Uh, but I think a printed uh, endeavor, something like the Lope, but Lope, of course, there's so much there and the corpus is very different. Mm -hmm. Perhaps with what the French are doing with the Chinese texts, I just well, I was in Paris last year. These are texts of two pages that are being published individually, with the historiography of the text, the manuscript, mm -hmm. and its publication. Every single thing I think matters. Mm -hmm. And I think that's another way of looking at it, besides the Syriac or, you know, the, the Armenian or whatnot, what others are doing. Mm -hmm. Uh, at least that is my interest for the long run. If I'm just you know, a bit past it, inshallah. 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 I said, mashallah, yeah. you should live long. Were there any more questions here? Yeah. Since you're interested in narrative, I, I found it interesting that you start at 200 because you're not interested in the Sasanians alone, you're interested in this Iran Iranian world. Mm. So, you know, a, global you history, in a global history narrative, one of the problems is that the uh, late antiquity, antiquity and this whole, you know, the framing has to do with the fall of Rome. I mean, it sort of kind of casts this shadow. You know, on the, on the larger narrative, we're going back to, and, and there's Alexander, who did everything for the, for, for, for the Persians and, the, you know, brought everything Greek, right? And then, and then you've got the fall of Rome. So, so there's two issues. One is the, the narrative, and where we cut and what are the important you know cut